Right, the final bit of my epistosis and complementary epistosis. And it turns out this is pretty similar to uh, recessive epistosis. Certainly it, it can look quite similar because it involves um, a homozygous recessive um, gene pairing, except this time, <coughs> excuse me, it, it's two lots of um, homozygous recessive gene pairs. So if, if we just follow uh, the example in the book, I, I think that's it's quite a good example actually. It makes things quite clear. It's from an experiment by uh, one of the guys who came up with Punnett squares. So we, we've got a chemical, let's just call it chemical X, and we have a biochemical pathway. Let's call it X, Y, and Z. And both of these, uh, X and Y, are colourless chemicals, and uh, uh, Z has got a purple colour. Now, when we talk about something being colourless, uh, usually that will express itself in a biological organism as it being white, okay? Um, so there's no pigment present in it and it'll look white. That's what you usually see. Um, when, when they did this experiment, they were crossing um, two types of, of pea plants, always pea plants because they have nice, uh, nice, simple, straightforward genetics. What they found was that in any kind of biochemical pathway, we hopefully know by now that enzymes are specific. So that an enzyme that turns X into Y will only do that job. An enzyme that turns Y into Z will only do that job. So let's call this one... Um, enzyme A and we've got a different enzyme here enzyme B okay so in other words to turn chemical X to chemical Y you've got to have um, A present and to turn Y into Z you've got to have enzyme B present to get all the way to purple they both have to be present if that is missing or if it doesn't express itself for some reason then you never get to chemical Y and the reaction stops there if chemical uh, enzyme B is missing or is not expressed yeah, you can go from X to Y, but you can't go any further. So you need both of them. So the suggestion was that um, what's happening here is you need at least one uh, of, of the dominant ones to be present in order for that to work. That one gives you nothing. And the same over here. Uh, we need at least one of the dominant ones to be present because if it's not, we end up with the homozygous recessive pair and nothing happens. Now, the Punnett square, if you were to draw this, is actually a bit simpler. Um, than we, I mean, you can draw the whole thing out, but um, we, we could write this as um, this little dash that we put to say it doesn't matter what the other allele in the pair is, it could be anything. We can, I think it's probably easier to write the whole thing out, and I'll, I'll just show you it again. So let's imagine we've got a, um, our, our heterozygote cross, so we've got A, A. Just fill them all out, and we can have big B, big B, um, little a, big B, and um, where am I going? There we go. That works. Okay. So there's my basic Punnett square. But since I know that, I, as long as I've got at least uh, one dominant A, at least one dominant B present, this is going to work. I don't even have to do the cross. I know that that's going to work because it's got at least one dominant A, B. In fact, all of that row is going to work, because they've got an A and a B. And the same here. All of that row is going to work, because it's got a dominant A and a dominant B. Okay? Um, will any more of them work? Well, that's got a dominant B, so anywhere I've got a dominant A, that will also work. Wrote this one. Well, I've got a dominant A there. Anywhere I've got a dominant B, that one will work. Everything else has got either um, only one dominant present, so that one, yeah, I'll write it out for you just to, to show you. I could write them all out, but there's not, not really any point. Okay, it doesn't matter that we've got a homozygous dominant pair there because our A's aren't going to work. So if we count them up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the rest are just not going to work. So we'd end up with a ratio of nine to seven. And that's the key ratio for um, complementary epistasis. In this case, you'd have uh, nine purples to seven whites. And that's why it's a bit similar uh, in some respects to, if you remember the um, recessive epistasis one, nine, three, four. Um, sometimes it, you might get a bit confused between these two things. That's why it's worth drawing these Punnett squares out. Make sure you know what the phenotype is. You know, as long as it's, and if you wanted to write the whole thing out, you could. Um, you know, that would give you purple. Oops. That would give you white and so on. If you want to write the whole thing out, you can. If you're happy with doing it like that, you can.